I'm Andrew Mellon and you're listening to the Celtic Soul Podcast. Today on the show I'll be chatting to Josh McCluskey and I have to say he has a very impressive Celtic FC CV. Big shout out to DC Thompsons who have sponsored this episode. DC Thompson are the publishers of Celtic in Black and White. To get 15% discount on the book, enter the code 90MIN, all caps, when you click into their advertisement on our homepage at CelticFanzine.com. And once again, thanks to all our sponsors for the continued support of both the fanzine and now the podcast. So if your Celtic supporters club or business would like to support the podcast and become a sponsor, please email us at info at CelticFanzine.com. And as always, you can contact us through the website or message us on social media or on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Christmas is coming, folks, and uh, I just want to give a special shout out to the Debenham workers who have been on the picket line now for the past eight months after Debenham's closed the stores in Ireland. Some of the women are in their 60s and she'll be looking forward to putting their feet up at this time of the year, but they're braving all weathers as they search for some kind of justice after 20 years' service. The women are doing six-hour shifts on the picket lines over a 24-hour period at the loading base to stop the liquidators from removing over £20 million worth of stock. If that stock leaves, the women think they won't get a penny in redundancy. This strike is now longer than the great 1913 lockout in Dublin, led by Jim Larkin and James Conley. To date, the government and the Minister for Trade and Enterprise have refused to support the workers. Well, that's the international break over again. No more international football till March. Thank Christ, as Ronan says. Yeah, it's been a bit of a disaster for Ireland, all right, Ronan. But Celtic are back. Tomorrow, Lenny and the boys travel to Easter Road to take on Hibs. I believe it, I believe it now. 3 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, just like football used to be. We never get an away game. And I suppose if the fans were back in the stadium, that game would have been played at lunchtime for television. An away day I always look forward to, which is usually an early kickoff, which means a red eye fly from Dublin into Edinburgh, breakfast on a quick point, up to the ground, chat to the usual suspects, back to team for 90 minutes, hopefully leave happy with a good result, dash back to the airport and home in time for tea. We've already beaten Hibs at Celtic Park this season, but they have proved that they will be one of the also runs this season alongside Aberdeen, and Aberdeen have already taken points off us, so we need to be cautious going into Easter Road. It's been a bumpy road so far, but back when we played Hibs in September, we kept a clean sheet with a back line of Taylor, Duffy, Beaton and Frimpong, with Mo. McGregor and Ayeti all on target. More of the same would be most welcome during these lockdown days. And other away days without travel, mates and crack. Get me a double shot of the vaccine quick. George McCluskey is currently a coach at Celtic after playing for Celtic in the 1970s and 1980s under the legendary managers Jock Steen and Billy McNeil. He made over 200 appearances for the club and scored 88 goals for the Hoops before moving down to join Leeds. He won six major medals at Celtic including four league titles. Hello, George. You're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. With the COVID-19 pandemic, are you back coaching at Celtic yet? No, I'm still furloughed at the minute. And uh, your goal tally's wrong. I scored 88. 88. Apologies, George. Apologies. I'll have to change that. Yeah, your facts right, big man. <laughs> well, when I'm actually, for the listeners' benefit, when I'm doing the introduction, I'll change that. I'm going to shoot the researcher. George, uh, so you're you're still out. So how are you? How are you filling the time in now? Oh, it's it's hard. Um, I built a wee gym up in the garage, so I got there most mornings and uh, can I potter about there for an hour or so. But uh, I'm a wee bit unfortunate. One of my daughters that stays with me is uh, she's shielding. She's got a kind of immune deficiency thing, so she can't go out to her work or that. And and it's basically because of that. That I'm I'm kind of shielding, you know. I'm I'm furloughed still. But it's the fact that I'm only part time, and uh, the reserves have now moved down to Barrafield, but they're getting tested like three times a week before they go training and whatever. So it would kind of break it up if I get tested, then was off for five or six days, then went back. So it wouldn't really work right, you know. I've, they've just furloughed me till further notice. To it. it's because it's safe for me to get back. I.e., we like Natalie and. To fit in with their schedule as well. I didn't realise that, George. Uh, I wasn't sure what way the reserves were. Um, I had heard they moved back to Barrowfield, uh, an old haunt of your own. You must have many great memories of Barrowfield yourself. Oh, we're talking about goals. I must have scored 4,000 up there at <laughs> Barrowfield. That was brilliant. Uh, great. And, I, and I, I prefer Barrowfield for the kids. I think 
uh, that you, they should be in sight of the, the football ground when they're training and aspire to get in there and give them something to aspire to, the kids, you know, the academy and whatever. So I like, I love, love Barrowfield. As the saying goes, it was good enough for the Lisbon Lions, it should be good enough for anyone. Ah, you're right, you're right. When I think of some of the escapades, um, I, rem- I remember Dixie Deans' first ever day came from Motherwell and in the days we walked from Celtic Park up to to Barrowfield and you had to take your own ball you know so everybody took their own ball walked up and we jinky says to Dixie let's see your ball we man we man I think that's flat and Dixie stupidly threw Jinky's ball and we jinky booted his ball into the back of a lorry and it was trailed <laughs> so he had to try and explain the big joke how we lost his ball without putting Jinky in it uh, but I carry on went on the days with you guys when you're walking down to, to training obviously you're meeting fans and people who live in the area Compared to now where, where the players are shielded, you know, and so much with social media now as well, George, it must have been a pleasure just to be part of that from fan. And then, like, when you were going into a big game, like, getting well wishes from the people and that you, the normal people who lived around the stadium must be wonderful and, and very uplifting. It was, absolutely. Uh, it was normal. It was more normal when you, you walked about. Uh, you didn't see yourself as a superstar. I mean, the days you, you mix with... The public now, these days, these guys are they're right up in pedestals, aren't they? And uh, they're, for me, just a wee bit too aloof from the fans, you know. Back then, it was you mixed with the fans. We walked up, as I said, for Celtic Park up to Barrowfield, and you met people going to their work every day. But, George, it was different, I suppose, back then because there were so many homegrown and local players at Celtic, and you lived it within the community. So, I'm sure if you did get a big head, you'd be brought down to earth very quick. Absolutely. Uh, as you say, there wasn't so many foreign players playing for the team then. There's a fabulous mix now and uh, and long may it continue, you know. Uh, but I still love to see uh, homegrown guys coming up through the academy and getting into the first team. That, that gives me a big kick. Yeah, and we, we've been lucky, George, because we've been, we have been able to get plenty of players through. Like we was, I was speaking to Steve Wall for a couple of weeks ago and I actually forgot you had the players that came through that time and played under Matt O'Neill because you kind of forget that. You know, David Marshall, Kennedy, Aidan McGeady, Sean Maloney, Steve McManus, there was a lot of them got their break with O'Neill and then that seems to have carried through. And even now, you look at the Scotland team the other night, uh, Tierney, McGregor, you know, all players that came through to Celtic's youth system. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I looked at the Scotland team the other night that qualified and... Uh, but eight or nine of them and all had some way went through Celtic's books kind of thing, you know. And then that was great to see. And the academy's got really, really strong. It's getting better. Um, and even nowadays, the amount of, of players that are getting, are getting a chance to get into the, the first team. And uh, as I said before, long may it continue. Um, I looked at Andy Robertson and uh, people like that that had been in the academy and uh, David Marshall, as you said, and uh, obviously we're on Celtic players that played, and it's great for us as the academy. Yeah, Tommy Johnson was saying that because of the grounding and the coaching that the Celtic players get when they're coming through the ranks, he said even, even if they don't make it into the first team, there'll be so many clubs looking for them because they'll have known what coaching and the football education they've had. Absolutely. The the, the one thing about uh, anybody that's came through the, the academy they get a great education. They get a great discipline. Their knowledge of football will improve everything. And and you'll just look at Scottish football today. Uh, it's riddled with ex academy players, and it's for the Highlands all the way through the the Scottish leagues. George, we take on Hibs on on Saturday. One of one of your old teams as well. How do you see that game going? Because we've had mixed fortunes. Yeah, I think it'll be a tough game. I think Hibs have improved over the, the last year or so and they've had a, uh, a few good signings that they've signed in the last six months to nine months. I think it'll be a difficult game for Celtic. It's always difficult when you go to Easter Road. Uh, but the, the, the only thing in your favour this time is there won't be a big hip support there. So that, that uh, maybe help, but uh, in these days you, you, you just don't know, do you? You just don't know. Well, home advantage certainly doesn't seem to be anything now, George. No. With, with some of the results, even even at Celtic Park now, you know, it, it, once a fortress, but 
It's just another ground there for players to play. It does. I, I think, uh, I might be a bit biased, but uh, I think Celtic more than MD miss the crowd because of Celtic Park and the atmosphere it creates and and uh, the fact that there's 60,000 Celtic fans here every week. I think it's uh, Celtic are kind of losing out more than any other club because of that. Big time, big time. Uh, and and I just, you know, we, we, we keep saying it over again. We just can't wait to get back to be part of it. As I said, you played with Hibs. You know, before we get into the Celtic stuff, George, can you fill us in on the incident with Graeme Soonis? People uh, get mixed up with that incident. They'll, they'll say it was a tackle. It wasn't a tackle. I mean, the game had stopped and I was remonstrating with the referee because of a foul that he'd had on Stuart Beatty. And I'm talking to the ref. And there was some Rangers players behind me pushing and shoving. And he's kind of slyly put his kicked in between all the bodies and kicked me and he just caught the back of my leg. And then he tried to get away, but the ref saw him, I think. But he, he kind of burst my leg and I got about eight stitches or something. But I, I still ran to this day, there must have been something sharp in his boot. Maybe a stud or something, I don't know. Because it wasn't that sort of kick. It's just the, the laceration it caused, you know. And do you have to go off, George? Yeah, to go off and get stitched. I had to go to the... It, it's, it was in a very tight part of your leg, so the wound kind of burst open, so I had to go to the Royal Infirmary and get stitches in it. Specialists had to kind of stitch it because of the, where it was. And did you miss much football after? I only missed three weeks. Three weeks I missed just to the, the heel. It healed up, you know. It wasn't that long at all. George, that could have been three win bonuses. You should, you should have <sighs> built them. I uh, should have, I should have sued them, should I? <laughs> but it wasn't the tackle that everybody said, what about that tackle? So it wasn't the tackle. The game had stopped and I was remonstrating with the referee, as I said, and I'm up against the ref. And there's some Rangers players running about me and he sneaked in and had a wee kick from behind. Uh, he must have thought I'd, uh, I was the one that tackled him or something. Uh, but I was only shouting for a foul for us. I don't, but, think, uh, I don't think Graham ever needed that. Uh... An excuse to foul someone or, or, or use dodgy. It, was, it wasn't even a foul. It was a, it was a malicious kick. That's all it was. A kick out when I had my back to him. And did he get away with it? Oh, he got sent off. He got sent off. I think the referee seen the blood in my leg. And I don't think the referee seen the incident, you know. I think he seen the blood in my leg and just sent him off. Well, George, I still, if, I, if I seen him, I'd be looking for them three bonuses. Ah, I, I don't think we get much bonus in days <laughs> at Hibs, maybe. <laughs> maybe 80 quid. <laughs> As, as I said, George, we, we, we'll talk about your Celtic uh, career. But later in your career, you teamed up with your great friend, the late Tommy Bones at Kilmarnock. He's won promotion together to the Premier League and Kilmarnock have stayed there ever since. That must have been a really enjoyable part of your career, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was. Uh, it was three great years. Well, two and a half years with Tommy. I was at Kilmarnock for three years. He left to go to Celtic, obviously. But it was great. Him and Starkey, Big Billy Stark was his assistant. And we had a, a few older players there and, and we were tagged as the grandpas of football and we'd never get anywhere. But it proved everybody wrong with a lot of the experience. Bobby Williamson and players like that was up front with me. And uh, we had a, a good blend of youth as well. There was a lot of good uh, kids that Tommy had brought through, Kilmarnock. And uh, it was a great blend. And luckily enough, it was a great Crowds were unbelievable. We were getting like 9,000 people in the first division. Do you know what I mean? It was unbelievable. The crowds were fantastic. The football they played was absolutely brilliant. They had the team. He was a madman, Tommy. The team is fit. He probably the fittest team in the league. And when they went to the Premier League, they were the fittest team in the league. He was just obsessed with this fitness thing, you know. And uh, it worked for us. And we done. And thankfully, Kilmarnock stayed up. They've stayed up in the Premier League ever since. And, and yourself and Tommy and, and Starkey and you you were great friends off the pitch as well. Absolutely. I was Tommy was my best pal in football, you know, all through my Celtic career. We roomed together and whatever. I, I always say he's a year older than me, but he says 11 months. He always <laughs> says, I'm not a year older than you, I'm 11 months. Then, uh, like, he was uh, the wide off of the tune, you know, the tuny boy, and I was the uh, Guy threw it in the sticks and he used to take a lot of me all the time. He would have done anything for Celtic George, wouldn't he? He was just, you know, he, he was just so uh, ingrained in the club, the local boy, like. Well, he was brought up in Soho Street, which was, I don't know, 
half a mile from Selig Park. And um, he absolutely adored the club and he loved the fans and he appreciated every moment that he played with Yeah, when you, when you think of his contribution, you know, the youth system, you know, the, rebuild, <coughs> the rebuilding in the club under Fergus, the Hamden season when he had to go to Hamden and then coming in, coming in in the background with Martin O'Neill helping him, you know, helping Gordon Strachan that great night. I think Arthur Barrow scored the uh, save the penalty against Moscow and there was a big pile up and I think Tommy was on top of it. That's you know? right, I remember it was that, just, man. you know, it was just, uh, he's just left such a, a footprint on the club. Well, as we spoke about earlier, the amount of players that have come through the academy that are now playing for Celtic and for other teams in Scotland, now or uh, Britain. Um, basically, that was Tommy that started that academy. He started the the kind of satellite centres, putting satellite centres all over Scotland. And, and it was his kind of uh, hard work and thing that made the academy what it was, you know? Yeah, uh, I've, I've had William McStay in the podcast as well and he really says the same as yourself about, about the, youth, the youth academy. And he kind of, he was kind of ahead of his time as well. He was obviously looking elsewhere and seeing, you know, what, what other clubs are doing in Europe. And because you need to, especially now, George, with money so, like, the money they're getting down the Premier League, you have to be able to bring your own players through. Absolutely. And I, I can still remember at Kilmarnock, like, uh, we were doing double sessions. And uh, he was one of the first to ever uh, bring food into it. Food's a massive thing in football now. I mean, uh, Celtic first team got a breakfast before the train and the reserves as well. They get something to eat before the train because nutrition is everything nowadays. And Tommy was doing that with Kilmarnock a way back then before any other club had done it. I don't know where he got it from, where he got the idea or what he, he thought of it or where he'd went. He'd obviously spoke to some sports scientists of some sort and they've told him he must, uh, nutrition is everything. And he was doing that. We, we were going into the kind of part suite, they called it, at Kumana and getting fed in there uh, before training. And uh, it was kind of revolutionary in the days. Yeah, and, and you look at what Tommy done and then you go forward or back and you look at what Jock Steen done at the club. You know, he'd studied the Latin game and, and there seems to be that. There seems to be every now and again someone comes along at Celtic and is maybe ahead of the time. Uh, uh, you're right, absolutely. And, and long may it continue, big man. Hopefully it's this season. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because obviously there's there's so much pressure on on the doing the ten. But look, we'll we'll talk about that in a bit. I mentioned Jock Steen there. He's the man that signed you and, and your brother John. Uh, is it true that he came to the house to meet your parents with Sean Fallon and maybe try to avoid and conquer? He did, I uh, because uh, Man United, Arsenal, and all that had been in for me, and uh, my dad was quite convinced uh, that we were going to go there. You know. Obviously, I didn't get involved money-wise or anything like that, but my dad had spoke to two or three. And just one night, Sean and Big Jock appeared, and Big Jock says to Sean, go and take John for a pint, you know? And so Sean took my dad to the local pub, the windmill, and uh, Big Jock stayed. And my, I'll never forget, my mum was making a pot of soup, and Big Jock was asking a stupid question. He, he wasn't even into it. He put the carrots in first. No, a lot, a lot of nonsense. He just tried to win her over, kind of thing. And, oh, you know what? I remember him saying, you know, if he uh, goes to Manchester or Arsenal, he'll not be homemade soup of that cheese when he's away. And he's trying to put the, the fear in there that I shouldn't go. And then the next minute, uh, Sean and my dad come back and the wee drink in them. <laughs> and that was it. They kind of agreed to sign that night for Celtic. So Sean softened. Your dad over well, yeah, just say divide and conquer. And Jack was clever enough to tell your mum. Oh, he was he was playing mind games with my mum, you know. And Sean would just get my dad drunk. <laughs> and when you think about it, when you think about it, like genius. Every every mother, you know, is worried if their son, you know, moves out of home. Even if they even if they're a football player or a bricklayer, what whatever they're doing, you are always worried. Absolutely. And he was playing mind games with him putting this oil, no get good food down there. You don't know who's looking after him and at least if he's at Celtic, he'll be coming home to you every night. And you can see my mum's mind working, you know, and she's starting to never mind Arsenal or Man United. will just stay, keep him at home, you know. But, but, but I John, don't think she wanted me to go anyway. But George, you're, 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 you're a Celtic fan. And did John sign the same time as you? Uh, John signed about a year later than me. 
Uh, he's two years younger than me, I think. He'd, we'd both signed like S forms and stuff like that, and Y forms, whatever they were. But uh, this was to get us to sign. I think it was the S form where Big Jock was trying to get us to sign. But John would signed about 18 months later after me. But he was he made his debut uh, in the European Cup, really. I think he was one of the youngest. In fact, he was the youngest ever to Dembele made his just recently. There. Really, yeah. And listen, um, I said there, uh, like, Obviously, born in Hamilton, but Celtic family. Celtic Absolutely, yeah. I, I actually had a cousin. My my mum's name's Ahara, and uh, I had a cousin, Tommy Ahara, played for Celtic as well. Tommy, well, he never gave me any first team games, but when was that, George? Tommy would be in. Uh, well, he was part of the uh, Quality Street gang. He was one of them. Maybe just a wee bit younger, but he played with Paul Walsh and Ken Rubliss, Danny McGrain, and all that. Pat McCluskey. Tommy played with all the him. I'll have to go down to the David Potter and get a bit, a bit of history on him now. That's a new uh, he, he died last year. So I love sadly, him. he died last year. But uh, he was a good uh, left back, Tommy was. So, so George, uh, Celtic debut 1975. I think it was the old uh, Cup Winners Cup in Europe. Uh, am I, um, or did I get that wrong? No. A funny, funny thing. Uh, was that again for Lou or Vice? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I have absolutely no memory of that game whatsoever. Dixie, De- I worked with Dixie Geans at the hospitality and that. And he can remember the game. Yeah, he's, I come on his sub and uh, I have no recollection of it whatsoever. None whatsoever. I thought I made my debut against Rangers. Well, I made my full debut against Rangers in 75, November 75, I think it was. Take us back to that first game against Rangers. Well, the first Celtic went through a bad, a bad spell at the time and... Um, Big Jock had been in hospital with a car crash. Remember the car crash he had? And they they get beat one nothing in the League Cup final the week before at Hamden. And my name was on the, the team sheet. There were like 15 players in the team sheet. And I, I, I was just there. I was still just off the ground staff. And uh, I was there to, I thought, collect the towels and whatever. So they played around at Hamden one week. It was the same 15 players named in the sheet as the next week when we were playing them at home. And uh, I thought, just the same, I'm there to pick the towels and get the boots and whatever. And when they read the team, when he stopped reading the team and that sat and I'll speak to him in five minutes, I went to go and get the, the boots and Ken of says to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get your boots and all that. He says, you're playing. I went, ah, I don't know. He said, did you not hear your name there? You're playing today. I went, geez, oh, you're joking. Uh, so <laughs> that was my introduction to the first day. I thought I was just there to get the towels after the game and get the players' boots and whatever. Uh, did we win that day? We, we drew one each But uh, I get money of the match for that, that game On the Wednesday we played Boa Vista We won 3-0 in the European Cup And I get money of the match in that game And the Saturday Big Joe could come back And we were playing up at Dundee And he dropped me <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know exactly what he done It's just that uh, Your heater will get too big You're, you're dropped That's it <laughs> So he put me on the subs bench. So, so when you made your full debut there, like, so you would have been playing with the likes of Danny McGrain and Kane Daglish would have been at that team. Yeah, Kane Daglish. Uh, uh, Pat McCluskey played. Uh, Dixie played, I think. Dixie Deans, Paul Wilson, people like that were all playing. Quality team. Oh, a good team. But at, at that time, they weren't winning in. They were going through a right bad spell. Uh, they couldn't win, as I say. They got beaten the League Cup the week before. So... <laughs> This is following on, George, from the nine in a row team. Yeah. So what, was, yeah. Was that it was basically was... just at the end of the nine in a row, that team was kind of breaking up and uh, they were bringing through like, this quality street gang. Some of them were coming through and whatever. The team, the team, uh, as you say, the nine in a row team were starting to kind of break up and get older. Then there was a lot of people retiring. Bobby Lewis had left, Jinky had left, Tommy Callahan, people like that, you know. Uh, it's funny I spoke to someone recently with this we've been speaking to people if they have any memories of the last nine in a row and they, they say to me like this is the ten in a row because it's the nine in a row has been done twice Selig have done it and Rangers have done it so they're forced to do ten because that nine in a row that run had to come to an end sometime so the significance of the ten wasn't as big as it is now No I would agree with you I think because um, but in saying that, 
Uh, teams back then, I, I think, were strong. Strong. I mean, they were uh, back then. Aberdeen were getting into European Cup. Dundee United. I mean, Aberdeen won the European Cup. Dundee United were beating Barcelona and all that. The teams were stronger back then. You know what I mean? They were yeah, playing. the league was more competitive. It was more competitive a league, uh, and today back then I thought it was harder. Yeah, well, like. I suppose when you think back to Ajax, like the two Edinburgh teams, the two Glasgow teams, and then Aberdeen and Dundee United. So they're up against them, and well, maybe that was a wee bit later, to be fair. Yeah. But they still had really strong teams. Kilmarnock's and that were getting into Europe as well back then. But I think uh, to get this 10, this would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, that that would be well above what they've done apart from the European Cup, I think. Yeah, and, like, and it, it, there seems to be um, obviously fans are missing, so that's 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 a big a big thing. We spoke about that earlier, but the the pressure now on every game is just you know it's on it's on every player is on, under the microscope. Every selection, every decision, every substitution, everything now, and with social media charge, you know some people make great comments, but there's also some headbangers out there. Oh, there's some head cases. A minority shouting the loudest. Aye. I'm uh, very lucky. I don't. I'm a dinosaur. I don't know anything about social media or computers or anything like that. I'm a dinosaur. And uh, I don't get involved in that kind of thing. But my daughters will come in now and again and show me, look, look at this one, see, or that one, see. And I'm like, God, unbelievable. You know? But uh, I, I, I just think that if we can get this 10 in a row, we've got to stay together. I, I just feel that it's us versus the world at the moment and everybody in, but their granny is trying to stop us getting this 10 in a row. And I think, George, that we have to answer that with searching the wagons and getting our grannies and everybody getting behind the team. And We just need it and just give it one big push. I think every Celtic sport, every player, every stick together don't start slagging the team. Don't slag managers and decisions that he makes. Or if he picks a team, just he's doing it for the best reason. You know, he's got his reasons. And, and it's more important this year than ever that we all stick behind him and stick behind the team. Yeah, here, here, George. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, we can get back maybe early next season maybe and, and have, a, have a celebration, maybe when the flag's going up. Because I just can't see us getting back this season, although we've had a bit of good news with the vaccines and that but I think that's out of our hands George I I think so big man uh, I, I just feel that there'll be no spectators at football through the end of this season I don't I don't see it at all it's too dangerous and lives are more more precious than uh, getting back into football in my opinion uh, you're probably right George you probably are right George now we spoke about you breaking into the Saturday team and that but then you had a a bad injury that put you out for 18 months. Uh, you done a cruciate ligament. Well, I had a cartilage in one, one knee and I had a cruciate ligament tear that I didn't know these days to get operation, but I had to kind of train with it and play with it for about a year. Uh, and it was, it was every time I kicked the ball, I was shooting pain up my leg. And before that, I had a cartilage, but they couldn't find out it was a cartilage. It was one of these what they call a bucket handle type cartilage, which is just the shape of a bucket handle. And every time I'd done it, it would flip out. But when I went to the doctors to get, get it examined, it flipped back in again. And they said, no, your cartilage is okay. And it took like six months to find out what it was. My, my knee kept long. And it was just one day, Big Jock says, right, out in the pitch, start shooting at Peter Latchford. And I shot one button, and it popped out. And he says, don't effing move, don't move. They phoned the doc. And the doc came for his surgery. Peter Lash was the academy into the treatment room. The doc came for his surgery. And he went, George, that's a normal knee. So I said, it's locked, doc. I can't do anything about it. John Fitzsimmons, old Fitz the cold. And he went, I can't feel anything at all. And then, oh, oh, they're just, oh, I know what that is now. I went, I've been telling these for six months. <laughs> all right, so next day I was rushed into a bunch of cures and get the up. So straight in time, is it, when you're out so long? Oh, it was for a horrible, horrible time. You're watching everybody train. And you're, you're forcing yourself to take part, but knowing it's going to go, knowing you, you, it's going to go on you, and every time you kick the ball, it pop out again. And it was just really frustrating and angry and, oh, bad, bad time. But you did come back, George, and there was uh, so many highlights. 
everybody has fond memories of the 1980 Scottish Cup final for a few different reasons. Obviously, your goal beat Rangers. Then there's a riot. And then <laughs> from the riot, they banned Boozer football and that still stands now. So, so nice uh, to this day. I get to blame it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your memories of that day, George? Obviously, uh, the game and all that kind of flew past and we, we got the result. But um, I remember a big copper, a big inspector guy had grabbed me and said, Take George, off the park, off the park. I'm like, this is terrible. Let's celebrate. Because you're a big blue nose, you're not letting us celebrate. That's terrible. And he said, George, look behind you. And I turned around and it was like the OK Corral. And I went, right, officer, get me off. Get me off. <laughs> <laughs> and he was doing me the biggest favour of his life. And, and, and there's that iconic picture of you jumping up, celebrating the gold, you know, in front of all the fans. That's a brilliant picture. Uh, one, one of the, the uh, I don't know what, where it was, or, but it was voted best uh, celebration photo ever. Really? Yeah, Celtic goal. And, uh, it was one of the polls that they had, and it was uh, voted, uh, the <laughs> best celebration. I still say to my grandson, look at your old papa, he used to go jump out the goals because the, the way the 40 is, <laughs> The goalposts at the far end are right below me. <laughs> I said, you didn't know your old papa could jump over the goalposts. Six medals, four leagues, the League Cup and the Scottish Cup. So there's so many memories. But another highlight, George, has to be the, the 10 men winning the league against Rangers. You score. Oh. Celtic win 4-2. You know, the late Johnny Doyle gets sent off. You know, that's such an iconic game. Oh, that was fabulous, fabulous night. That was... Um... And I can see I, I'm trying to claim two goals. I actually came across, along the byline, smashed it in the hook, calling Jackson the face and run out the goal. I'm away claiming that and all, but they wouldn't give me it. But it was uh, oh, it was one of the best nights of my life. Uh, and I, I remember the incident. Alec McDonald sitting on the ground and Doyle just went up and towed them up the bum for no reason. And I went, what have you done? But you know, he walked by me and his eyes were aglaze. He'd gone, the game was too big. It got it gone completely. It made so much to him, you know, and uh, it was. Un- I said, "What have you done?" And I'm saying, "Hopefully, he just gets a, a booking." But no, referee red card right off. And as he walked by me, I was like, and he's like, just, his eyes were glazed completely. And I remember after the game, uh, we'd won, and there was about four thousand people in the red. Everybody was in. My dad was in drunk. Everything he was all in. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, old Bill Peacock had been drinking a whiskey during the game and he was uh, supposed to be the doorman, but he let everybody in. And uh, eventually I go, I need the toilet, go to the toilet. I was in, just about to get in the loomy doily there and he's roaring and greeting, crying his eyes, oh, thanks, thanks. I don't know what I'd have done if we'd lost that. I don't know what I'd have done. And he was roaring and greeting on our way. And we doily always thought he'd sell a wee heart, man, you know, a wee toughie for a few park. And he, he didn't want to empty. And it was funny because uh, Big Billy had said, right, come in about 11 o'clock tomorrow and we'll see what we're doing or whatever. So I got to the, I was in in Doyle's car there and as I walked by him, he says, Toby, Toby, that was my nickname, Toby. Toby, in the car. I went, what is it? I'm just in my car. So he got, I get in his car and shut the door and I said, what is it? He says, don't you tell MD I was great last night. <laughs> <laughs> You swear it. Don't tell him that I was green. <laughs> but it mu- it must be, he must have been a lonely man in that dressing room. Oh, my God. That must have been horrendous. He must that have was... kicked every ball in there. Honestly, God, I, I can't even imagine what he went through sitting in that dressing room, especially as he's walked by Big Billy and that would have gave him dog's abuse as well, you know? We talked there with Celtic players, you know, and Johnny was Celtic true and true. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Johnny was just mad, mad Celtic. Celtic, big Celtic family of Doyle's. And uh, he was probably the worst of them, you know. Uh, Tommy Burns says that he's a fan that that played and Doyle and myself as well. But Doyle was mad, mad Celtic fan long before he played for them, you know. Yeah, uh, but, I, I'll never forget the day. He says, "Don't tell him that I was crying." Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. And like we we said there, you know, the players that you played with, as you said, there was a transition when you were coming in, and then. There was other players, we say, from when you come back from injury, there was new players in the club. And as your career progressed, you know, what, what players stand out for you, George? From well, obviously, the best player I ever played with was Kenny Dalglish. He's just way above everybody, you know. He was way, way, way above everybody. And I played a couple of games with Jinky and on. He was just special. But 
Jen, Jinky for for a centre forward would, would drive you insane. I mean, uh, he'd go along up the wing and he'd go to the byline, you make a run, run to your front post and he'd turn around and go back and beat the defender again. He used to go way back to it again. <laughs> he'd go again and he'd, be, he'd want to beat the defender again, you know. <laughs> what chance he got, you know. But uh, Douglas was special. He had everything. Everything. I just uh, I just thought he's the greatest I've ever seen. Really? Absolutely. Greatest I've ever played with. And, and you've played with quite a few, you know. You, like obviously, Danny McGrain was in that team, thought would win the best full back. That's right. I, mean, I played against Cruyff. I thought Douglas was better than Cruyff. Really? Uh, yeah, I thought Douglas was better than Cruyff. Now, I, I spoke, I interviewed a few people, and I always say, What would they like in training? What was Douglas like in training? It just, it just the same in training as it was on the park. Everything was 100%. Yeah. Um, I, watched, I watched Scott Brown. Nowadays, training, everything's 110%. Every single thing in training, everything he does, every run he does is 110%. Uh, I've never seen him do train as much. And it, it shows how he's, uh, he takes on to the park and how he's as good on the park and how he's a fit, kept himself played. Everything he does is 110%. Unbelievable. He's had some longevity at the club. When you think he, him and James Forrest have been there for the nine in a row. Unbelievable, isn't it? And do you know something I hate? James Forrest gets a bit of stick off some sections of the Celtic fans and they don't appreciate how much that, that guy does for their team. The amount of goals and important goals. People say that I always scored important goals. But James scored some really important goals for us in the last, I don't know, what is it, eight, nine years. Yeah, I think I think it was really came good under uh, Rogers when he had probably Paddy Roberts, you know, a bit of pressure from Paddy Roberts. But you know, James's final ball is far superior than, than the likes of Paddy Roberts. Absolutely, absolutely, and he's starting to get goals now. And he had before Brendan Rogers came. I always felt he'd a wee problem with his injuries all the time, but they seem to sort it out there. They seem to give him stretching exercise or whatever it was. And uh, as I said, Celtic fans don't give that boy the praise that he's due and uh, the amount of stick I hear some of them, some sections of them, you have no idea how much, boy, how much he does for the team. Yeah, no, And it, it, it's funny, we miss him now that he's injured. Absolutely, and see, what, see you play in that position to be up and down and up and down the full game, because that's what Brendan Rodgers is asking, he's getting asked that nowadays. He'd need to be superhuman fit to do that, you know? No, I, I agree with you, and like, I suppose that there was talk of going to Tottenham at one stage or going down to the Premiership, and I'm sure there has been interest. And then today is like years ago, there was a lot more players stayed a lot longer at clubs. But with, with the money down south now, you have to take your hat off to Scott Brown and James Forrest. Absolutely. If they've 100%. stayed with us and they've been there, and hopefully they'll be there till the end of the 10 as well. I mean, hopefully we get that league, George. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so, Andrew. George, I just want to bring in another two players there that you played with. Coming like are your later years in Celtic, Frank McGarvey was signed and Charlie Nick was there, so there was a, there was a lot of competition for places. But someone told me that Billy often played the three years together. He did. Uh, Billy was uh, kind of what would you say revolutionary and that kind of thing. Nowadays, a lot of teams play with one striker. Billy was probably first to play with three strikers. No, I thought no a front three, but three actual out and out strikers. And basically, we just played wherever along the front line it suited us, you know. So that was harder for teams to maybe... If you'd an out-and-out striker, the centre-half could say, I'll pick him up. But we would drift out to the right or out to the left or in the middle, so they didn't know who was going to be where. And I think there was one year we scored over 100 goals between us and we still lost the league. And they were both out injured for a time as well, George, weren't they? They both broke their legs, I think, in the 1981 season, was it? Yeah, uh, and I was. Billy Ty couldn't catch any luck. Two of his, two of his three strikers out. Aye, uh, and I was kind of late. I think uh, at three or four different. Danny Craney, I know, played a few games with me up. I think Danny Craney played up front me for a wee while and got a few goals, top goal scorer that year. I think, yeah, I, I think it was Ray and George, um, and maybe it was in your book. Uh, I think you got 25 in the league or something that year, which is some... Aye, 25 goals in the league, something like that. Some return. Uh, it was good. Uh, plus, when, when the other two are out, you're playing every single game. You're not going to rest. You might be two games every week. Don't yeah. get me wrong, I prefer to play two games every week and then it was less training. But uh, there's a lot of pressure on you for every game. You know, a lot of expectations on your shoulders. Yeah, that brings me... Uh, uh, the perfect man to answer this question for me. At the moment, we have four strikers. 
playing for basically one jersey because we're now playing one up front. How does Lenny keep them all happy and hu- and hungry? Because like not even French Eddie has nailed that jersey this season. So it's still up for grabs, and we're now we're now in November. I, I, I just think it's a hell of a hard job Lenny's got in it. Uh, trying to pick, I mean, obviously everybody will go for Edward, but Edward's not really an out and out striker. He likes to come back and get the ball to feet and maybe like a ten and a half row kind of thing, isn't he? Uh, so I, I'm not sure who what the best partnership is, and um, uh, Lenny's got a hell of a hard job to pick out who it is. Do you play a Yeti up front, or do you play the Polish boy Patrick Kamala, or or who? Griffiths you know, is there as well. Griff's been kind of in and out yet, hasn't he? He's been, I think he had uh, a few injuries, plus he was out for a wee while there, and he had a few injuries. But when, when Griff comes in, he scores goals for you. So yeah. how can you keep him out? Then, I mean, then a perfect example, you bring him on to Aberdeen, he goes and scores a goal. So how it's hard to keep him out. It's, uh, as you say, it's an impossible job the manager's got to keep them all happy. But like, it's good that we have four strikers, you know, if they're all fit and they're all looking for the jersey. Sometimes I look at them this season and maybe it's just the way Eddie, you know, he's he's, he's so cool and, you know, the French right. way of going on. Sometimes, you know, you're kind of looking for a bit more from him. And, but then you're kind of saying if he doesn't start, you know, he's a quality player. Like So even as a fan, you're kind of going, well, who's he going to play and who should he play? And we've all got an opinion. But at the end of the day, Neil Lennon's going to live and die by these decisions. Absolutely. And uh, I just think it's uh, Eddie's personality. He's that laid back, isn't he? It's a French kind of way they play. And and even though he doesn't look as if he's trying a leg or whatever, he's really trying his best, you know? And, and that's the way he plays the game. That's, there's, there's times, uh, I, I think it was one of the, the games last year when he ran away from the other Rangers players. And you're saying, pass it. Pass it, pass it, pass it, and they kept going and going. They pass it, oh, don't be so greedy. Pass it, oh, great goal! Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know they're going, Oh, yeah, greedy, so and so. Oh, forgot, oh, goal, yes, what a goal! And that, that's what you're going to get off him, you know what I mean? I think he runs me away by the halfway line, and you're saying, I can't mind who was up front or who was beside him. She passed it, I think it was the boy Sinclair. You're going, Give him it, give him it, give him it, <laughs> goal. I, I always remember him, George. Uh, I always remember kind of, it's, it, it's kind of coming of age or Celtic when Brendan took him off the bench in Oibrox. I think I think we were down to 10 men. I took him off the bench and I think he, he scored the goal in front of us in the Brimlow end. Like, and it was, you know, we were just, we were just toasting him. And he, like, Patton this season, he's been consistent since. Like. Aye. Uh, see, it's his style that maybe a lot of people, supporters, go against him, but you can't go against his record. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. Look at the record he's got, um, and and it's just, I think it's the pressure on the fans to get this ten in a row that they're getting so upset about it. You know, they th- think people are not trying or they think this. The fans need to calm down and let Lenny deal with, it yeah, and let him pick and just get behind them. Yeah, I, I suppose I suppose the couple of the European results haven't helped us, George. But you had. Uh, a couple of great European nights, and you mentioned Johan Cruyff earlier on there, and there's obviously people remember your goal against Real Madrid, but the AX game, was that the highlight of your, I suppose, Europa nights? Yeah, I would think so. Well, the, the great night in Celtic Park when we beat Real Madrid, uh, beat them 2 nothing. and natural fact, I scored another goal with a head, and they gave it for offside, but it was a cutback, I couldn't have, couldn't have been offside, no way I could have been offside, if that had been 3 nothing. we definitely went through you know, but uh, as we I missed a chance over in Madrid uh, late on in the first half. I think I was halfway through the, the first half. I had a wee chance, and I never never scored with it and get my head doing a wee bit. And then, but the referee was diabolical. They were just giving them everything, just gave them everything. Uh, and that was probably my worst away thing in in Europe. But then, as you're saying, the Ajax to score in the last kind of minute. They put us through it was just unbelievable, you know. And you were doing, you were doing. Uh, I remember you telling me one night, uh, and hopefully share it with the listeners. Charlie Nicholas says he got Cruyff's jersey, but it was you that got his jersey, wasn't it? It was Charlie Nicholas got fourteen, but that night Cruyff wore nine. And uh, I'd went into their dressing room, and I was, I was over the moon. I was high as a kite. I'm trying to get them all to swap jerseys, 
And every one of them had their head down and said, no, no, I'm no sure, I'm no sure. And I went, ah, piss off a lot easy. And I went to work out. And uh, Cruyff was getting a rub. I never even noticed him. He was getting a rub on the bench right in the middle of the room. And he shouted to McCluskey. And I went, yes. He said, I will swap with you. And he, he's smoking like a linty. He takes his fag out, gives it to the trailer, pulls his jersey off and gives it to me and gives me a cuddle. I was like, stuff the rest, you said they want yours. <laughs> got the real man's here. So I went out with crowd stairs. Brennan. Don't let a linty. And they take, give his fag to the, the wee physio and they take his jumper off. Unbelievable. But you don't have that jersey anymore, George, do you? No, there's a bad story of that, I know. Come on, share um, uh, When I got home, uh, my brother John, he, he was playing five-a-sides. And uh, my mother had just washed it, the jersey, and he wanted to wear it to the five sides. And then I did with the old coal fire with a big guard to keep keep the kids back for the fire, obviously. And there John went and sneaked out, got the jersey. I went to my bed because we were late coming in and whatever. And he put it over the fire to dry, try to dry it, and he bumped it. What do you think? <laughs> bumped it on the back. And for weeks and weeks, I'm saying, well, where's that jersey? I can't find that jersey. I don't know where it's went, George. I don't know. Only about three years later, he told me. <laughs> he tried to dry it to wear it in five sides. George, have you, any, uh, have you any prized piece of memorabilia or anything from your playing career? Just my medals. Just my medals. I've actually, I've got the ball for the Scottish Cup final. Really? I've got, uh, I've got the ball, I uh, for the Scottish Cup final. So that's probably my... Apart from my medals, the most prized possession. No, oh, brilliant, brilliant. And because uh, I was wondering, like I was wondering, the players, you know, hang on to stuff. Or, I'm, I'm uh, Neil, Neil Morkin actually went and get the ball off George Smith, the referee, for me. Uh, yeah, I wasn't brilliant. even thinking about that, but Neil was that here. There we present for you. I said, "What is it?" He said, "It's the ball you scored for." I went, "Oh, thanks, Neil." I wasn't even thinking about him, like you know. No, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And listen, you grow up a Celtic fan. You played with all these Celtic greats. Many of them Celtic fans, you know, you played against Rangers, the big one. You beat them, you scored goals, you got hatchets in your career. Leaving George, you left and went to Leeds. Was it mutual? Were you pushed or did you jump? Um, I basically pushed or jump. I don't know what it was, but uh, I, I was on, uh, I think the top player at Celtic was on £350 a week. I just, the year or four or the year before that had been the top goal scorer in Scotland and uh, they offered me £180 a week to sign on and I says you've got guys here at £350 a week I'm your top goal scorer they said we'll give you £180 a week and I went oh. I said I don't want more than the top goal scorer I don't want more than the top paid I said make me the same as the top I think it was Roy Aiken I think it was Roy and I said, just make me the same as him. I don't want it anymore. I'd love to finish my career here. And they went, nah, we'll, we'll give you £190 a week or something. And I went, no, nah, I'm not saying for that. And Leeds came in and offered me £500 a week, you know. So there's some difference. But I, I would have stayed at sale for the rest of the year if I would. But that was the Kellys and the Whites. But Desmond White was the chairman at the time. And they were just, they, they, I think because they thought I was a supporter and a thing me that I would just stay for nothing. But um, eventually, I was what I think it was twenty five or twenty six, and then you've got you start thinking about wait a minute, I've done a short career, I've got a family here now, and I've got to think of them. And I'd say I was pushed out the door, man. I didn't want to go, um, but I had to go because of the one hundred and eighty pound a week. My dad was working the Ravens and getting one hundred and fifty. Yeah, it must have been a sad feeling, but leaving the club was it? Oh, it was gut wrenching. Even my first three or four months at least was terrible. I was still thinking of Celtic. I was still thinking about maybe I should have stayed and took the 80, 180, you know. And it wasted my life for about six months to a year, to be honest with you. Uh, I never wanted to go, but I was pushed because he, they wouldn't give me a decent living wage, kind of thing. So, so you, and you played for a number of clubs after that. You know, came back up to Scotland. We mentioned Hibbs, we mentioned Kelly. I think you played with Hamilton as well and, and finished your career at Clyde. Yeah. But your heart was always a Celtic, was it? Absolutely. No, I never left Celtic Park. Never. As I say, I, st- I regretted every minute leaving, but I had to leave because they were just they were just taking a lane of me because I was a Celtic supporter. Well, so, George, you're still there. 
hospitality on match day and you're, you're still coaching on Celtic and passing on all your experience. And just from chatting to you, I know that you just love the place, be it the training oh. ground or, the, or the, when you were played or even in the, like, and I know the great relationship you have with the fans because I met you many, many years ago and we've always stayed in contact and had a wee drink now and again and a chat and a catch up and you know I'm always trying to get some information out of you but I still get the biggest buzz in my life when again you do the hospitality or I turn up at the training ground every time I go I still get a buzz about I still think there's people would give the right arm to do what I'm doing I'm only going to coach or I'm going to do my hospitality I said there's people who give that because I'm going in the hospitality I'm meeting the first team I'm meeting superstars like Bobby Lennox, Dixie Deans, Tommy Callahan, Evan Williams, them were having a wee banter for the game and I still get as big a buzz out of that as anything. I know you get a great buzz because we've done a couple of Q&As and that and you know, you've always had a, had a great, as I said, great relationship with the fans and you've come down to Malone's a couple of times when we were doing Saturday AM and we really appreciate that. So George, um, once again, it's been a pleasure to chat and I thank you for opening up your Celtic soul to me and the listeners and hopefully we'll get back to normal maybe next season and we'll be back in paradise and we might get a coupon up. Uh, I'm not allowed to bet now, but you can buy me a pint. <laughs> <laughs> always, George. I've always got I've always a couple of quid for a point for you. Thank you so Good much. Great, right, buddy. God bless. Wow. What a career George has had at Celtic. Important goals, famous league wins, famous cup wins, riots, booze bands, and the players he's played with. Kane Daglish, Jimmy Johnson and Danny McGrain. Not to mention Johan Cruyff, who we played against. The managers, Jock Steen and Billy McNeil. And his best friend in football, Tommy Bones. All three iconic figures in Celtic's history. Folks, there's about 20 print copies of More Than 90 Minutes, issue 111 left. So thank you so much for the support. Don't forget, you can order a copy and I'll stick it in the post the next day. You can also download the digital edition from CelticFanzine.com. Anyone taking out a subscription will receive a free t-shirt or a badge in the post as a thank you for your continued support. With no match day sales, your support is so important so we can keep the print edition going. The new scarves arrived today and have been posted out. Visit our online shop for some Christmas presents and stocking fillers. T-shirts, polos, hoodies, scarves, badges, kitchen sinks and a selection of up-to-date eye makeup. Well, that's my Del Boy sale pitch done. You know it makes sense, Rodney. This time next year, I hope we're all back in Celtic Park. As always, thanks to Ronan McQuillan for producing the show and for buying some of our eye makeup. (laughs) <laughs> green white and orange of course listen folks if you like what we're doing with the podcast and you would like to support us you can do so by visiting celticfanzine.com where you can become a member subscribe buy or donate for the price of a point we promise no unwanted google adverts on our website or articles and no unwanted advert interruptions on our podcast we're trying to keep it real we're trying to keep it independent so your support means we can continue to produce quality independent fan journalism podcast video content We'll do some free live events if we ever get back to venues. Don't forget, folks, to download the app. It's free and you'll have access to all our podcasts, articles, daily news, video and info on events, the fanzine and our online shop, all at the touch of a button on your phone or tablet. All episodes of the podcast are now available on all podcast hosting platforms. So hit that subscribe button or the follow button and you'll never miss an episode. As I said earlier on, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter. Thanks again to our episode sponsors, DC Thompson, the publishers of Celtic in the Black and White Era. To get 15% discount on the book, enter the code 90 M I N all caps when you click into our advertisement on our homepage at CelticFanzine.com. If your business or Celtic Supporters Club like the podcast and would like to become a sponsor, please email us at info at CelticFanzine.com. You can also contact us through the website or message us on social media. Keep all your comments and suggestions coming in. And here's a few comments from last week's podcast. Johnny Vaughan of Harford. Now that's a man. Terry Goodson, Twitter. Loving the podcast. Keep up the good work. Donation sent. Mick Scannon, Nave Park, Celtic Supporters Dublin. Cheers, Mick, for the donation. Good listen. Think Johnny Vaughan was banging the money apart from Cal Mack. I reckon sticking Turnbull in front of him will speed up the play. Bring on Brown to see it out if needed. You change nothing, then nothing changes. Eddie Cantwell, Glasgow. Enjoyed part two of the Johnny Vaughan podcast. Frank Trundle, St. Margaret Celtic Supporters Club. Many thanks from all of us at McCool's for the shout out on the podcast. Thank you for the support. Nick Stewart. As always, a class interview. Enjoy the insight into Stephen Kenny's early career as manager, the Munich trip 
and the US electoral situation. Tony Ratton in Sunderland. A great listen, both episodes with Johnny Vaughan, top class, Kieran Kenny Dublin. Celtic Soul podcast, spot on, always a good listen on them dark morning walks. Jim Smith Dublin. Johnny Vaughan, very enjoyable. Charlie Down and Cog. Rudy Vata, what a story. MC on Twitter. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the podcast as much as we did chatting to George and putting the podcast out. We'll be back with another episode on Tuesday. The reaction has been so positive to our little chats with players and fans and everybody who opens up their Celtic soul to us. So keep the suggestions coming in for guests. We're walking away on all the suggestions we've had so far. And once again, thanks again, throwing up some good ones that we wouldn't have thought about. Enjoy the weekend, folks, and hopefully Celtic will give us a boost we need tomorrow for this winter blues we're going through. As we said last week, we want to lend our support to musicians and songwriters out there who have been hit the hardest by the lockdown restrictions with no gigs or venues. And we're asking you to send your material in and we'll give it a play and give you a little promotion. Last week, Derry singer-songwriter Declan McLaughlin played us out. Roland has been going around the office all week humming. Freedom's just a t-shirt. Freedom's just a t-shirt. What a tune. Yeah, best of luck to Declan and we're looking forward to hearing the new album. And this week we change totally different music. We have a dance track from Toxic, who are from Drada. They produce electronic and hip-hop music. Check them out on Spotify and they have two new albums scheduled for release in the coming weeks. We'll play out with the dance track Home. Don't forget to check them out on Spotify. Stay tuned, stay safe and as always, keep the faith. Without you